while it is commonly taught in the realm of ancient history that the first civilizations of humanity arose in Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, and India, few are aware that concurrently, and in some instances even preceding some of these societies, another significant civilization had blossomed, the Norte Chico civilization of Supi, Peru. This civilization, with its capital in the sacred city of Corral, represents the earliest known civilization in the Americas. Corral, a 5000-year-old metropolis, boasted complex agricultural practices, a rich culture, and monumental architecture, featuring six large pyramidal structures, stone and earthen platform mounds, temples, amphitheaters, sunken circular plazas, and residential areas. The Norte Chico civilization, also known as the Carol Soup civilization, is one of the ancient civilizations that emerged in the coastal region of Peru. It is considered one of the oldest complex societies in the Americas, flourishing around the same time as ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, and the Indus Valley civilizations. The civilization is named after the Norte Chico region, where its archaeological sites are located. In the heart of the north-central coastal region of Peru, nestled along the meandering banks of the Soup River, lies a captivating cluster of valleys known as the Norte Chico. Amidst the rugged beauty of the landscape, a tale unfolds, a testament to an extraordinary past etched in the remnants of very early monumental human settlements. In this ancient realm where time seems to echo through the ages, urban centers like Bandaria, standing proudly between 400 and 2000 BC, and Espiro, with roots reaching back from 3700 to 2500 BCE, tell stories of a civilization's early stirrings. Towering above them all is Carol, also known as Carol Soup, a city whose grandeur transcends the bounds of its contemporaries. Revered as the oldest city in the Americas and one of the earliest cities in the world, Carol emerges as a symbol of power and influence. Remarkably, the rise of civilization in Peru predates the famed Olmec civilization of Mesoamerica by a staggering 1,500 years, as noted by scholars. Carol, with its enigmatic aura, takes center stage in this ancient drama, a pioneer of human ingenuity on the American continent. Yet what sets this narrative apart is the isolation that shrouded the Peruvian journey to urbanization. Unlike cultures in distant corners of the world, the birth of cities in Peru unfolded in splendid seclusion. The Norte Chico, a cradle of civilization, stood as a testament to human resilience, innovation, and the mysteries woven into the fabric of time. Subsistence practices in what is now Peru's Norte Chico can be traced back to as early as 9500 to 800 BCE, when small groups engaged in hunting and gathering. During this period, there is evidence of plant selection and rudimentary gardening, as indicated by the remains of irrigation channels dating back to that era. The burgeoning interest in cosmic and religious matters played a pivotal role in uniting emerging social groups around spiritual concepts. This collective consciousness, in turn, gave rise to social stratification, marking the beginning of economic cooperation that extended across the Andes and the coastal communities of northern Peru. The expansion of agriculture became evident, and by 3200 BCE, cotton had already emerged as a significant trade crop in the Norte Chico region. This versatile material was utilized in crafting fishing nets and, later on, in the construction of net bags known as shikaras. Concurrently, the domestication of cane lids, particularly llamas, gained momentum during this period, further influencing the socioeconomic landscape of the region. To explore the ancient civilizations in this area, let's delve into the field notes of renowned Peruvian archaeologist Ruth Shady Solis and other researchers. The fertile Soup River, winding its way to the coast from the western Piedmont of the Andes to the dry coastal plains, hosts 21 ancient settlements sharing common architecture and urban distribution. These settlements date back to the late Archaic period, around 3500 BCE. At the mouth of the Soup River on the Pacific coast lies the late Archaic site of Espero, dating from 3700 to 2500 BCE. Espero appears to be the origin of human settlement in this part of the Norte Chico. As demographic pressure increased at Espiro, along with growing social complexity, communities divided into groups that moved up the Soup River Valley, establishing villages upstream. Espiro's strategic location played a crucial role in the initial economic development of the region, offering access to abundant schools of fish in the cold northbound Humboldt Current and controlling the sea salt trade with burgeoning inland communities Carol and other nearby communities were constructed 14 miles up the coast in the 60-mile-long Soup River Valley 
situated on the arid plateau extending on both sides of a ravine and the fertile yet narrow valley where crops were planted. The settlements on the plateau, on each of the upper sides of the ravine, were thus protected from seasonal floods. In the time frame of 3500 to 3200 BCE, Carol, covering 165 acres, evolved from a village to a city, alongside Era de Pando, 200 acres, and Pueblo Nuevo, 135 acres, while neighboring hamlets like Cerro Colorado, Lehman, or Cerro Blanco did not exceed two or three acres. Between 300 and 2900 BCE, Carol emerged as the seat of regional power, led by Caracas, heads of lineages who wielded control over political, socioeconomic, and religious affairs. The principal Caraca headed a network of districts extending from the Pacific coast to the foothills of the Andes, organized around trade and reciprocity. Religion served as a binding force, fostering cohesion and acting as a symbol of shared cultural and spiritual identity within the network. Carol's monumental pyramidal step structures, associated with sunken circular plazas, underscored its significance as a secular and religious power center. The seven massive temple pyramids, along with residential complexes of varying sizes, marked Carroll as the oldest city in the Americas, supported by 29 radiocarbon dates. Carroll and its neighboring communities on both sides of the Soup River may have accommodated a population exceeding 20,000 individuals. Ruth Shady, in alignment with the findings of Feldman and Greeter et al., asserts through field research that the Carroll Soup Society exhibited social stratification, with local authorities linked to a state government sustained by a productive and diversified crop production and fishing economy. Farmers cultivated fields irrigated by a simple system of canals drawing water from the Soup River, its tributaries, and numerous springs. The socioeconomic dynamics fostered internal and external exchanges, enabling the development of complex technological and social organizations. Carroll's direct control and economic dominance extended over populations in the Soup, Patavilca, and Fortaleza Valleys, with influence reaching across the entire north-central Peru region from the Andes foothills to the coast. Shady emphasizes that evidence suggests Carroll served as a model of socio-political organization, a milestone achieved by later societies throughout Peru. The remarkable achievements of Carroll's inhabitants, referred to as Carolinus by archaeologists, encompassed aspects from architecture to religion, showcasing their dynamism, creativity, and interactions with social groups in the upper reaches of the Andes. Carol's history and culture were intimately tied to its ceremonial calendar, harmonized with nature and the changing seasons. However, the Norte Chico cultures were also shaped by two significant natural factors historically associated with the decline of civilizations in northern Peru. These factors are intricately linked to the rise and fall of Norte Chico cultures. The first disruptor is the combined impact of climate events triggered by El Niño and La Nina, influencing global weather patterns. El Niño is associated with a band of nutrient-poor warm water and atmospheric convection that develops in the east-central equatorial Pacific and extends to the east coast of South America. The Nino Southern Oscillation involves the cycle of warm and cold sea surface temperatures in the tropical central and eastern Pacific Ocean, with high air pressure in the western Pacific and low air pressure in the eastern Pacific. El Nino's moisture-laden clouds result in intense rains, floods, and landslides, causing devastation to cultures. It can be followed, though not always, by La Nina, its colder counterpart, occurring a year or so later. During La Nina episodes, strong winds push warm water away from South America across the Pacific Ocean, leading to below-average sea surface temperatures in the eastern Pacific. Cold water then rises to the surface near South America's coast, associated with prolonged droughts over the South American continent. These complex occurrences vary in intensity and may recur in cycles of 7 or 14 years. The second set of disruptors are earthquakes triggered by the collision of the massive South American tectonic plate and the heavier Nazca plate, moving eastward from the Pacific and subducting beneath the South American plate. The friction between the plates and the subduction zone along the Peru-Chile Trench is the primary cause of earthquakes and volcanic activity in the region. To mitigate the disruptive effects of earthquakes, Carol's inhabitants ingeniously designed their constructions to have a certain flexibility during seismic events. In response to seismic challenges, the inhabitants of Carroll devised the Shikra, a net crafted from a blend of cotton and vegetal fibers, filled with loose rocks. Chakras, containing over 1,000 pounds of rocks, were discovered in the foundations of structures. Smaller shikaras were employed to transport stone loads weighing 15 to 20 pounds from quarries to construction sites. These stones were strategically placed in retaining walls, enabling structures to absorb seismic disturbances with minimal or no damage. 
Complementing the chakras were lentils or beans made from morango, a durable hardwood from the mesquite tree, such as the algarobo blanco, prosopis alba. These materials reinforce doors and passageways, alongside massive stone pillars serving as central supports. All structures, irrespective of size, were constructed using shaped stone blocks set with mud. Carol's significance is highlighted by its 32 monumental structures and various residential complexes. In the upper section of the city, seven large pyramidal structures stand, with the Great Pyramid and the Pyramid of the Amphitheater associated with large sunken circular courts. Major structures encircle multifunctional open spaces or plazas, forming two subgroups. The western subgroup includes the Great Pyramid, Central Pyramid, Quarry Pyramid, and Lesser Pyramid, while the eastern subgroup features the Pyramid of the Amphitheater, the Pyramid of the Gallery, and the Pyramid of the Wonka. A wonka, an upright monolith typically left uncarved, stands 8 feet tall and is positioned 300 feet away from the plaza and the two pyramids at the end of a causeway. Archaeologist Shady observes that Carol's structures in the central space are divided into two halves, an upper half, closest to the water, where the most impressive pyramidal structures are situated, and a lower half with smaller public buildings, except for one large complex that also incorporates a circular sunken court. The spatial organization of Carol likely reflects the Andean binary division into Hanan and Huron, corresponding to upper and lower levels, respectively. Pyramidal structures within the city vary in size and features, yet they all adhere to a comparable style and design for their facades. Archaeologist Shady notes that each building follows a similar model, featuring superimposed terraces at intervals and enclosed by stone walls. Each facade is oriented towards a fixed stellar direction and has an internal axis dividing the space. This axis is typically marked by a staircase running through the center of the terraces from the base to the summit. The staircase also divides the building into a central body with two extensions on the left and right, each containing rooms and passageways. The central body comprises segments arranged sequentially at specific elevations. While providing a comprehensive description of this 5,000-year-old city is beyond the scope here, archaeologists Shady, McCoy, and Aramburu will focus on three major structures, the Great Pyramid, Sector E, the Pyramid of the Gallery, Sector I, and the Temple of the Amphitheater, Sector L. The Great Pyramid stands out as the largest, most extensive, and crucial complex in the upper half of the city, measuring 561 feet from east to west and 495 feet from north to south. Its south-facing facade is 65.5 feet in height, while the north side facing the valley reaches slightly less than 100 feet. A significant feature is the circular sunken court and an imposing stepped pyramidal structure, consisting of a central body and two side components. Noteworthy within the structure is the altar of the sacred fire, situated at the pyramid summit, accompanied by a small quarter with a ventilation shaft below it. The circular sunken court, attached to the north side of the pyramid, has a diameter of 120 feet, and its sunken interior measures 72 feet across. An entrance stairway ascends from the exterior along the south side of the court, aligning with the axial staircase of the pyramid. On the north-south axis, two other staircases descend to the court, each framed by two large upright monoliths. The internal court wall is constructed with stone blocks reset at 1.5 feet to an elevation of 5 feet, creating a stepped appearance. The walls, stairs, and floors of the plaza were plastered and painted. Given its size, location, and connection to the circular court, the pyramid known as La Galleria likely served as the primary public building in the city. La Galleria gets its name from a monolith positioned approximately 300 feet from the main stairway of the pyramid. This quadrangular plan pyramid is situated in the east subgroup, at the extreme southeast of the upper half of the city, Hanan. Its facade is oriented toward the shared urban space with the Pyramid of the Gallery in Sector H. The eight-foot-high monolith, or Wonka, appears to have been the common axis for both structures. The Pyramid of the Wonka exhibits the typical stepped profile, comprising five superimposed terraces on all four sides, measuring 177 feet on its east-west axis, 171 feet from north to south, and reaching a height of 42 feet, it features an 18-foot-wide central stairway leading to an atrium assumed to be an observatory. Noteworthy among the findings in the building is a headdress made of grassy fiber. The complex of the amphitheater, along with its monumental circular sunken court, dates back to 2160 BCE. This structure holds significance in the lower part of the city, serving as the counterpart to the Great Pyramid, Huron, although not as imposing as the latter.
The walled complex comprises various elements, including a deck with aligned cubicles, a large circular sunken plaza, and a building with sequentially ascending platforms. On the east side of its perimeter stands a circular altar and an elite dwelling. Within the building, several ceremonial hearths or altars of the sacred fire were discovered, each with ventilation shafts underneath. Buried in the circular sunken plaza of the amphitheater were 32 flutes, finely carved from condor and pelican bones, along with 37 bugles made from deer and llama bones, pointing to the ceremonial significance of the structure. The artifacts discovered in Carol, including flutes and bugles, were adorned with incised designs and painted representations of local fauna and humans. The primary altar of the sacred fire was situated in an isolated area within the wall encircling the amphitheater complex. The religious ceremonies conducted there, typical of ancient agrarian societies, centered around the powers of the sun, the moon, water, earth, celestial bodies, and their respective deities. This religious framework traces its roots to the Kotash religious tradition of the late Archaic in the Upper Andes, influencing Carol's religious practices throughout the millennium between 300 and 2000 BCE. Priests were believed to derive their spiritual power from predicting cyclical natural events, such as the cycles of the sun, the moon, and other celestial bodies. Consequently, they were recognized as the anointed intermediaries between people and the deities of nature. However, lacking the scientific knowledge associated with later observations, priests could only acknowledge the repetition of events that occurred at predicted times. What they couldn't foresee were nature's variables, including the intensities of the aforementioned disruptors at Carol. As in many ancient societies, there was no clear distinction between secular and religious aspects, as religion served as the nexus of cohesion and the state ideology acted as the instrument of government domination. In Carol, as noted by Shady, most activities were, in one form or another, connected to religious rituals and sacrifices. The most significant religious ceremonies likely occurred around the altars of the sacred fire in the Great Pyramid and the amphitheater. Less important ceremonies took place in other buildings. The shrine for the sacred fire often consisted of a small circular platform with a fire pit, where small offerings were burned, resembling those found at Kotash. The circular platform of the sacred fire in Carol was enclosed by a low, quadrangular wall, standing six feet high. This open space provided access for only one person, likely the high priest. A ventilation duct was strategically built beneath the hearth to direct heat and smoke outside. In this shrine, the high priest invoked natural forces and deities to ensure the timely occurrence of crucial natural events such as rains, winds, or other phenomena and their impact on crops. For many ancient societies, planting and harvesting were daily concerns, particularly dependent on weather conditions, especially rain. Delayed or insufficient rains could result in poor or failed crops, leading to famine and the return of fear and death. Therefore, priests played a crucial role in assuring the city's elite that the gods facilitated an understanding of nature's hidden behavior. Another notable architectural feature at Carol is the large sunken circular courts located at the base of the monumental staircases of the Great Pyramid and the Pyramid of the Amphitheater. These courts served multifunctional purposes, akin to the Maya rectilinear ball courts, hosting events at specific times. Religious ceremonies likely took precedence, celebrating major events like spring and autumn equinoxes, austral solstices, and the rising and setting of stars and planets. These ceremonies were mythologically tied to gods, deities, and seasonal festivities such as planting and harvesting. The discovery of finely carved flutes and bugles beneath the sunken court of the Pyramid of the Amphitheater underscores the importance of musical instruments during ceremonies and pageants. While remains of drums have not been found, potentially due to the perishable nature of their materials, drums have a recorded history dating far back in time as one of the oldest devices used by various cultures. The sunken courts likely hosted secular games, similar to ball courts, to celebrate social and sporting events, addressing the inherent human desire to compete in a controlled environment throughout history. The universal use of games for both secular and ritual purposes emphasizes a commitment to maintaining peace and balance between communal factions. Essential to ritual and, to some extent, secular games was the need to manage latent antagonism within the same polity and between different polities. In several buildings at Carroll, archaeologists have uncovered human burials, predominantly of children or young adults, often associated with specific rituals. Shady highlights an illustrative example, the discovery of the body of a young man placed among stones that were being utilized in the construction of a new atrium. 
This body was found above a layer of soil and stones, covered with additional stones and the floor of the new atrium. The individual, a male of approximately 20 years, showed signs of enduring strenuous labor throughout his short life. He had suffered two forceful blows, one to the face and another to the head, leading to his demise. Interestingly, some of his fingers were carefully positioned in one of the niches of the temple. Children's remains were found beneath the floors of dwellings, a burial practice believed to contribute to the longevity of the building, a belief later observed in other cultures. Residences also yielded kipus, knotted strings made of camelid fibers like llama or alpaca wool. Kipus, used since the late archaic period or possibly earlier, served as recording and communication devices organized in a base 10 positional system. Those discovered at Carol rank among the oldest in Peru. Additionally, small, low-fired ceramic figurines measuring around 5 inches in height and 2 inches in width were found in both secular and religious contexts. These figurines bear a striking resemblance to those from the San Pedro's phase of the Valdivia culture in Ecuador. The small carol figurines, low-fired and adorned with red and gray colors, typically feature arms that are short and bent toward the chest or placed under the chin, mirroring Valdivia's characteristics. Ceramic diffusion across the Americas occurred over an extended period in vast geographical areas through trade, with some replicas found at Carroll. The floor plans of residential houses vary based on their proximity to a pyramid complex, directly reflecting the resident's status. The architecture is consistent in both upper and lower Carroll, with collective structures built from rocks set with mud. The most extensive residential complex in Carroll is situated in Sector A in the upper part of the city, Hanan. The quadrangular houses feature a primary entrance at the front and a door at the back, potentially designated for the kitchen or other services. These houses range in size from 530 to 860 square feet and boast interconnected rooms, reflecting the household's status. Numerous rooms contain small platforms and benches, possibly serving as beds. The walls and floors were adorned with plasters in white, beige, or light gray hues, while those with red and yellow paints may signify residences of the Carol elite. A long-standing debate in Peruvian archaeology revolves around the origin of cultural diffusion, questioning whether it began on the coast with its abundant marine resources or in the Andes Mountains, extending towards the Pacific coast. According to archaeologists Jonathan Haas and Winifred Creamer, a sophisticated society emerged in Peru due to irrigation agriculture, mirroring the development of the world's other foundational civilizations such as Mesopotamia, Egypt, India, China, and Mexico. Historian Carl Wittfogel emphasizes that irrigation acted as a catalyst, transforming tribal societies into city-states by necessitating forced labor, central planning, a managerial elite, and generating surplus food to support workers and administrators. In Carroll, the state government thrived on dynamic, diversified crops and a fishing economy, exerting dominance over the populations of the Soup, Patavilca, and Fortaleza Valleys. The intricate network of social groups sharing water spanned five ecological zones, with rivers originating in the high Andean Altiplano, flowing through the mountain Piedmont, and eventually reaching the coastal plains and the Pacific Ocean. This topography played a crucial role in Carol's survival for over a millennium. Haas and Kremer challenged the notion that the exploitation of marine resources alone is responsible for cultural complexity. They question why a series of similar complex societies doesn't emerge up and down the Pacific coast if marine resources were the sole driver. Haas argues that late pre-ceramic sites like Asparo and Banduria achieved complexity because they could engage in trade with inland settlements revolutionized by irrigation agriculture. The undertaking of significant public construction projects is a hallmark of a complex society, and the general consensus is that complexity arises from mastering agriculture. Hunter-gatherer societies lacked the means and necessity to establish social hierarchies. The process of creating social hierarchies, involving the division of labor and the emergence of a managerial caste, commenced only with the transition to settled farming. Nevertheless, the sparrow, situated at the mouth of the Soup River, may still hold surprises. Recent radiocarbon dating has revealed that this village, boasting two large platforms and circular sunken courts, thrived as early as 3033 BC. Carol and its neighboring communities in the Patavilca and Fortaleza valleys were abandoned between 1800 and 1600 BC. The reasons for this abandonment remain uncertain, but archaeological and geological evidence points to the relentless impact of natural disruptors, unforeseen by priests. Geological data indicates that around 1820 BC, an earthquake, estimated at 7.2 on the Richter scale, 
struck and devastated much of Carroll and Asparrow. This major seismic event likely led to successive tremors of varying intensity over subsequent weeks and months, contributing to more unstable rock and mudslides into the valleys. The damage may have been exacerbated by an El Nino event that coincided with or closely followed the earthquake and its aftershocks. Evidence of torrential rains and consecutive gravel and dirt slides from the surrounding hills, identified by geologists, serves as testimony to the destruction of agriculture, leading to rivers and wells in the valleys becoming clogged. The mouth of the Soup River faced significant sedimentation, aggravated by storms, powerful winds, and shifts in ocean currents over several months, resulting in the formation of a coastal sand belt known as the Middle World. This situation further strained an already precarious food supply, as ocean temperature changes associated with La Nina pushed fish schools farther and deeper offshore. The challenging conditions were compounded by climate shifts and inland sand blown from the coast into agricultural fields in the valleys, causing additional destruction to cultures and obstructing canals already damaged by rock and mudslides. Carroll's neighboring communities to the north and south were similarly devastated by these calamitous events. The food shortage reached a critical point, leading to the collapse of the economy alongside the loss of cotton production and fishing. Despite the efforts of Carroll's priests, the dire situation left the inhabitants with no choice but to flee and seek refuge in less affected communities. Nature's powers were unforgiving to Carroll. In 1800 BC. End of Norte Chico Civilization the Norte Chico civilization comes to an end, with the complete abandonment of its cities and the disappearance of its distinct cultural practices. The reasons for the sudden collapse of the civilization remain a topic of debate among archaeologists and historians. Despite its decline, the legacy of the Norte Chico civilization continues to be recognized as a significant milestone in the development of complex societies in the Americas. Thank you for watching. I wish you have a good time. We are also honored to have you join our family.